Thanks, Ty. Um, okay, so um, I will call this uh, special meeting of Thursday, April 20, 2023 to order. Um, and um, it's, uh, did I say 7.03? It's 7.03, calling order at 7.03. And we've got, uh, um, when I know that, um, that Daryl and Anne and Wes, Ty, couldn't come. That's correct. Yep. So we've got Adam and Karen and myself and Alice and Chris. Um, so that makes a quorum. Um, I don't think we're going to be doing any voting, but I'll elevate Chris um, in any case to voting status tonight um, and get right into, into the, the new business agenda item number three. Um, and the Planning and Zoning Commission um, is reviewing certain sections of the zoning regulations. Um, we've been doing this for several months, um, and this uh, review follows up on some legis legislation coming out of the state legislative sessions, um, and also falls out of some of the recommendations of the POCD and the and the updated housing plan. Um, the purpose of this meeting tonight is to is to hear public comment and feedback regarding um, some of these proposed changes. Um, I'll, uh, this is a public meeting, which will be audio and video recorded, just like every other Planning and Zoning Commission meeting. Um, to ensure sound quality, the default rule is uh, that everybody remain on mute, except when speaking or voting. Um, and the commissioners will generally keep the video of themselves on. Um, uh, members of the public should feel free to leave their video on or off, but we ask that you, um, that you turn your video on, um, and certainly your microphone on, um, when you are... Uh, giving us some of your feedback later on. Um, and if you do speak and when you do, please uh, state your name and um, uh, I think that's it, state your name. Um, be respectful, um, listen carefully, try not to just uh, to interrupt and stay on topic. Um, speak for yourself and not for others. It's okay to disagree, but remember that this is a discussion. Um, be candid and avoid making assumptions, especially about uh, the intention, beliefs, um, or motives of others. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to turn this right over to uh, to Glenn Schalder from Planometrics, who will run us through some of the things that we've been talking about over the past couple of months. Matt, thank you very much. I put together a PowerPoint to provide an overview. I think many of the people uh, in the Zoom session have uh, familiar with a uh, number of the regulation changes that are being proposed, but I just think, again, for informational purposes, I'll just uh, give a quick overview uh, here tonight uh, as we go. So as Matt indicated, the commission has identified some issues they wanted to address as part of the regulations. Um, so the things that the commission has been considering in terms of regulation changes are, are parking, new provisions for senior living, reasonable accommodations, I'll explain that a little bit later, uh, camps and special permits, accessory dwelling units, and then the conservation development regulations. And again, tonight's meeting is to get input and feedback. So um, we're interested in your thoughts on the possible regulation changes so that uh, we can make improvements and enhancements as we go. Um, there is an informational packet that was posted on the town's website. Uh, it's been there for probably three weeks or more. Um, and so if you have it or you want to go get it, um, you can uh, go to the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission uh, webpage. Uh, bottom right corner is the agenda packet for the meeting. Um, and clicking on the blue line here on the agenda will take you to the information, which is uh, the information packet. Um, and that'll allow you to make notes as we go or circle things or uh, uh, otherwise you'd like to come back and, and talk to. So the first section of the regulations, I just wanna give you a quick overview tonight is changes to the parking regulations. There's a couple of reasons for this. Um, state statutes were changed as uh, Matt indicated to require or mandate lower parking standards for uh, one bedroom, um, multifamily units, apartments, condominiums, et cetera. Um, and then as part of making those changes, the commission also talked about some other changes to the regulations. So the changes that are being uh, proposed or considered here will allow on-street spaces to be considered. And this really only applies in the uh, village uh, area. 
Um, we've updated the parking standards to reflect information from the Institute of Transportation Engineers in terms of actual parking use. Um, so we're not going to try to require more parking than uses are reasonably going to need. So enough, but not too much. Um, we'll also allow for a modification of the amount of parking provided if there's technical information for a particular use that indicates that you know, the parking standard is lower, the commission could consider that. Um, we've added in provisions for maintenance and striping, a situation you can sometimes get in a parking lot as the striping disappears over time and then uh, the parking arrangement doesn't become as efficient as we would like it to be to provide parking for the different uses. We've modified the regulations the commission adopted last year for electric vehicles um, and the statutes actually use the word infrastructure uh, to be installed, but not actual chargers. Um, so we made that change, uh, again, to comply with uh, state law and provisions related to electric vehicles um, and charging stations. Um, there had been separate parking standards in other sections of the regulations. They essentially duplicated uh, the parking section. So we generally changed and eliminated those and referred people back to the parking section now so that all parking standards will be the same in all the zoning districts. And then finally, as part of this work, we found that we had um, parking standards for shopping centers, which we didn't think was really what we had in Kent at all. Um, and that phrase actually appeared also in the sign regulations. And so we're proposing to delete the term shopping center um, because it's not really used. So that's the nature of the changes to parking regulations. To hold your thoughts or questions to the end, we can certainly come back to these slides and then talk through the regulations specifically. And I can bring the regulations up on the screen um, when we want to talk about those, if that would be helpful. Next section of the regulation is a new section to be added in the regulation related to what we're calling senior living. Um, and this basically allows for developments uh, in Kent um, that would potentially provide independent living, assisted living, or skilled nursing, or a combination of those um, in uh, a particular development, uh, particularly uh, age-restricted uh, for people, uh, seniors, uh, and provide different housing options for them, and uh, a continuum of care, if that's what the provider wanted to provide. The regulations are going to be changed to allow this by special permit. The zoning districts being considered are the village residential, the village commercial, and the industrial, which is all close to the center of town um, and um, has, generally speaking, sewer available. Um, and then also is permitted in the RU1 district, larger parcels of land. So that might be a different flavor. Um, but again, the uses would be permitted by special permit. Um, and this is to address, you know, an aging population, older people looking for um, different types of housing choices and housing options. So that's the uh, change to uh, for senior living. It's the adoption of some new definitions and then changing the use tables in the zoning districts um, to identify this use as permitted by special permit. The third regulation change is what's called reasonable accommodations. There are provisions we find in state and federal law that people may have uh, particularly um, um, issues which uh, are protected by state or federal law. Um, and sometimes zoning regulations don't accommodate that very well. And so as a result, people have to get variances, which requires a declaration of hardship um, and hardship specific to the property rather than the issue related to the person. So this provision for reasonable accommodations would go into the regulations and essentially allows for a modification. For example, if somebody wanted for mobility reasons to put a handicapped ramp on the front of their house, but that intruded into what we call a front yard setback, the zoning regulations would generally not permit that. But a reasonable accommodation would be, if you need a handicap ramp, you should be able to put one in uh, to be able to enjoy your, your home, your property. Um, and this uh, provision would allow for that. So it doesn't require a show of hardship, which generally relates to the property itself, but it does require the applicant to demonstrate 
a couple of things. First of all, there's an applicable state or federal law that applies. The modification is appropriate. It's no more than reasonable or necessary to address that scenario. Um, and there are strategies employed to mitigate any impacts on the abutting property. So if we, if we go back to the example of the handicap ramp, the American with Disabilities Act would provide some measure of applicability here. Um, the modification of installing a ramp is appropriate uh, to allow people to access their home. The ramp is uh, hopefully no more than reasonable or necessary. It's you know not a whirly bird around the house or anything else like that. It's a uh, direct connection, if you will, from the front door to the parking area, things like that. Um, and maybe there's some landscaping or shrubbery that gets put in, you know, to ameliorate a, a visual impact. Um, so this is a provision which I think is uh, helpful um, to allow people to address these situations with, again, not having to show hardship. The uh, next change relates to camps and special events. Um, Kent has permitted uh, camps for many, many years, and Initially, they were essentially youth camps, which uh, addressed people under the age of 18 and provided camp experiences for them. Their club getaway is actually not a youth camp in the way it's defined in state law or the way it was defined in the Kent regulations, yet they've been in operation for many years. Um, so this uh, regulation change is to accomplish a couple of things. First of all, it creates a definition of a youth camp and then a camp slash resort. Um, and that's to separate a youth clientele from uh, a more expanded clientele. It can include youth, it can include adults, et cetera. Um, it allows a camper resort to become a conforming use in the RU1 district by applying for and receiving a special permit from the commission. As part of that application, they would file a plan to show the improvements on the site um, and other uh, buildings or improvements that they may want to be building in the future. Um, and with the commission of, of approval of that improvement plan, um, those additions or improvements, uh, a mess hall or a cottage or other types of improvements um, could be built without having to come back to the commission regularly in the future for uh, additional permits um, if the commission was to allow staff to approve those through zoning permits. So that issue would be decided at that particular time. And then finally, the other major element here is to establish a framework for two categories of activities at the camp resort. The first is part of the initial approval of the special permit would establish the baseline of activities which can be conducted on the property um, because it's normal as part of a camp and resort. Um, but then there may be other types of activities which are outside of the normal scope of a camp or resort. And the commission could categorize those as special events. Um, and in those scenarios, um, somebody would apply for approval for special events based on a, what we're calling here a management plan concept, which is perhaps meetings which are uh, outside of the normal realm of the camp, that there would be demonstration that there's adequate uh, traffic management or um, uh, health and safety or emergency medical or other types of uh, events or activities that may be needed, fire departments aware in case you know they want to provide any staffing, et cetera. But it's just to address the possible scenarios that might occur as part of those types of events. The special events, there are some considerations which are added in here. Um, I think there's three major categories that I just wanted to mention for people here tonight. First of which is a notarized statement that you know the club or camp is taking responsibility for the event. Uh, it's not being leased or uh, operated by a third party, which has no relationship with the commission or anything else. Second element is that a management plan would be provided. The management plan overall would categorize the types of events, the size of events, the number of events proposed during the course of you know a time period, week, month, year, season, et cetera. Um, how long those special events might go for? Is it one day, half a day, two days, a weekend, those types of scenarios? 
And then also how the uh, camper resort would address potential impacts from those types of activities. I kind of mentioned those before, traffic, uh, emergency response, et cetera. I think one of the concerns could be uh, related to noise or amplified sound. Um, and so the commission would have the ability to consider whether there's adequate provisions that have been made to address amplified sound um, for specific days or specific hours of the day, um, and also any other externalities that might happen in terms of garbage and, and other types of activity. So it's not assuming that those types of activities or uh, impacts will occur, but just giving the commission the tools that they may want or need in that situation to make sure that things happen smoothly. Commission made a number of changes related to accessory dwelling units. Um, and this came through as a result of what commission knows as Public Act 2129, um, but also recognition in town of the housing challenges that, that some people have and face. Um, and so this is a uh, significant change, I think, in the overall approach uh, to accessory dwelling units in town. I think this is the one provision that I would encourage people to go look at what's in the package and look at it carefully. Um, it's hard to summarize it, but I'll do my best. Um, so in the village residential district, a single family home can have one accessory dwelling unit within the house by, special, by zoning permit, excuse me, or if it's a detached accessory dwelling unit or a guest house, they can do that by special permit. They would apply to the commission or a special permit. And then there's also a provision for a second accessory dwelling unit by special permit if one of the units is deed restricted is affordable. So that means that there are some properties that could have a dwelling unit plus two accessory units, only one of which could be detached from the main house. Um, and this is in the village residential area um, and again would, uh, with the regulations which are in effect for that district. In a similar vein, we've also extended the allowance for an accessory dwelling unit or a guest house to a two-family house, and they could have one accessory dwelling unit or one guest house, provided one of the units, one of the three units on the property, either a unit in the two-family or the guest house, again, is deed restricted as affordable. The other zoning districts, uh, there's one accessory dwelling unit attached or detached for a guest house in the RU1 district. In the RU2 district, which is the Birch Hill area, there's only allowance for an attached accessory dwelling unit and only by special permit, given the lot sizes, configurations, et cetera, in that area. And in the village commercial and the business hamlet, um, again, one accessory dwelling unit or guest house um, accessory to a single family home. There are provisions in the regulation for the deed restriction for an affordable unit. And we're still reviewing and considering exactly how that is going to work. But the unit would be deed restricted to rent at an affordable price uh, for uh, the situations described here, such as a second or a third uh, unit on the property. Commission then spent some time working on the conservation development regulations. Uh, when the new regulations were adopted, I think it was in 2016 or so, the conservation development approach in the RU1 district was established at that time. Um, and there was a conservation development overlay district, which basically requires conservation development in the RU1 district. Subsequent to that was a regulation change to allow conservation development in the village residential district. And the regulations that were adopted for each of these two scenarios weren't consistent with each other. So one of the things we talked about with the commission was trying to make the language consistent in terms of how it's applied. Um, so you'll notice here from the pages uh, uh, displayed, I know they're very small on the screen, but hopefully you can see the red uh, type on there. These are regulation changes to make these approaches much more consistent. Commission has clarified that the open space set aside requirement is going to be based on the percentage of the buildable land, which is not constrained by resources, not the total area of the parcel. Uh, so as a result, um, that calculation will be different than it has been in the past. 
the commission had categorized uh, in the regulations primary and secondary resource categories. And this was supposed to result in an inventory or analysis map as part of the POCD process. There were a number of comments about why were we distinguishing between the value of resources. They're all important. And the commission felt it made sense to eliminate that language, those requirements, um, and basically require an analysis of all of the resources on a parcel um, and to factor that into the design or configuration of the development. Um, so those are the changes being approved, uh, proposed to the conservation development approaches. And again, they're both uh, being amended to make them uh, more consistent with each other. So that's a quick overview of the regulations. Uh, we're looking forward to public comment and input. Um, and if uh, necessary, I have the regulations uh, keyed up on my screen. I can bring those up when the time comes. So I'll turn it back to Matt to recognize speakers and, and see where we go. Uh, thanks, Glenn. Um, what I thought we would do is is take these um, one at a time and talk about them in the order that that Glenn presented them and um, give the public a chance to um, comment on each of them and then have the commission comment as necessary and then move on to the next. Um, so if we start with the parking regulations, um, I would open I would open this up to members of the public. And if you want to speak, there's I, I think I can see everybody on, on a single screen. Um, if you'd like to say something, um, either raise your hand virtually or um, put your put your video on and raise your hand um, and make yourself known. Um, so, OK, um, I see uh, Justin. Yes. Hello. How are you all doing? Thank you very much for undertaking this review. A lot of great changes here. Um, let's see. So back in January, we submitted a letter just uh, noting that the parking and the kind of affordable housing developments was a little bit excessive and suggesting that we have a, you know, continue to have a separate category for affordable housing. Um, and then the response at a subsequent meeting was that uh, it was section 8250 allows the commission to um, consider uh, evidence and other information to reduce uh, parking requirements as necessary, except for, now if you go down to the third bullet, it states, except for requests to mo modify the parking requirements for a residential use. So that seems to suggest that the parking requirements could not be modified um, for residential use, such as you know to lower parking requirements for affordable housing. So, Justin, I thought that was a great comment, great observation, great catch on your part. Um, I think uh, one of the things that I had wanted to mention at an earlier meeting this spring that I think that you were at was that if you could uh, get for us the information on the number of vehicles registered to people who are tenants there, I think that would be the kind of information that would now help us say, okay, you're right. We we don't have the same scenario there. And I think here, uh, I think this language certainly is worthy of modification. Um, so we'll take a look at this and I appreciate your pointing this out, bringing it to our attention. Thanks, and yeah, if you're doing it this way, I, I think that, you know, it does make sense because it um, would allow you to modify the regulations for a new different circumstances, not just for affordable housing, but that the first line there, except for requests to modify parking requirements for residential use. Um, that seems to eliminate that possibility. So, yep, good catch. Thank you. Any anybody else in the public who um, would like to comment? Um, and what about then the commissioners? Is there is there anything that that's that we would like to add, or any individual commissioner would like to? Comment at this time. Um, okay, so I I I I, th I think we'll um, we'll move on, and and if we if we need to come back later, we 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 can to give give somebody else another bite at the apple. But let's move on to uh to the senior um, living um, 
definition, senior living development, um, uh, new regulation. And this this was somewhat added because um, we don't have anything now um, since we got rid of the convalescent home. Um, so we wanted to, to make sure that we were able to have this kind of development in town if that was the pleasure of the community. Um, I don't see anybody who's got comments from the public. And we, as a commission, have certainly talked about this um, several times. So if there's no comments from the commission members, then I would move on to reasonable accommodations. And as Glenn suggested, this is this is a fallout of some of the things that we've been uh, wrestling with over the past year, I guess. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we codified it in the regulations and I'd open this up for comment to the um, comment from the public. And from the commission. We're on a roll. Um, then I, I would uh, I would suggest that we move on to uh, to camps and special events. And I know that we've got um, um, David Schreiber here, who I'd, um, I'd, um, I'm certain has some comments and suggestions. So I'm going to I'm going to break the roll here. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but um, I, but before I get started, I, I do really want to thank everybody. I know it's hard to to fit a square peg into a round hole, and I guess we're a square peg. Um, and uh, I, I know the amount of work that's going into this, so I really appreciate it. I think it's going to be great for the town, and I think it's going to be great for Club Getaway as well. So thank you. Um, with with that being said, I, I just I guess I have a whole bunch of questions, and some of, some of it I may be going a little bit in the weeds and talking about some hypotheticals. Um, but I, I do want to. The first question I have is I just want to confirm. It's probably the most important question I have that. One spe the, the special permit 6620 is like any other special permit and connect it with the property um, and it's a permanent special permit. Is, is, is that correct? It's a special permit is provided in the regulations. Yeah, so that uh, it uh, comes to the commission, gets reviewed in accordance with the special permit criteria in the regulations. And upon approval, the commission signs a, a certificate of approval that gets filed on the land records. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Um, I, so just going into 2200, um, I, I just I just want to understand the definition of a special event. And, and I'm assuming I know this, but I just want to confirm this. Um, based on what I was reading, a special event is anything beyond that is approved by 6620. Is 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 that correct? I believe that if this is you know for the commission to review and consider. So, David, whatever I say here tonight is the work I've put together for the commission to consider. But and you you need to understand, I'm sure you do, that this isn't final at this point in time, and we're thinking about this. But the right. basic approach here was that, um, as you indicated, uh, Club Getaway, uh, whether it's you know a round peg in a square hole, square peg in a round hole, is different than what the commission historically their regulations permitted. Um, right. So the scenario here was to say, okay, well, let's get back onto a playing field here that the, um, a, a camp would apply for this special permit, uh, propose activities, historic, and then possible future. And the mm -hmm. commission somewhere in that spectrum would draw the line and say, above this line, everything's good. You are good to go. That's part of our approval of your camp. And then things below the line or outside of the line or whatever would be, hang on a second here, that's potentially big enough or impactful enough. We're going to want to take a closer look at that. So I think it's the type of thing that is very hard to define up front. Um, but mm -hmm. It's the type of thing I think when the commission sees it uh, and works with the applicants in these types of situations, say, okay, you know what? Yes, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Slow down. Let's talk about this one, et cetera. So I think the first attempt here to address this issue is going to be a little bit more challenging 
uh, and time consuming than you know a normal type of application. But I think right. it's going to provide a benefit and understanding for both parties going forward. Perfect. Th thank you. So I, I just I, I just want to give for clarification. I want to give two hypotheticals on on special events. I mean, obviously, we know if I said. I'm hosting a music festival. That's a special event. There's no question, and um, I am sure that would be denied in a heartbeat. But um, with that, with but but just certain things like if I was to submit a, an operating plan and apply for a 6620, this was two years ago. I would give a thing that we were that when our camps come up, you know, in a whole arrival procedure, right, where where buses drop off. We don't do any sort of parent pickup or drop off or anything like that. Um, now. You know, as of last year, we started working with um, the Park and Rec and, and hosting Camp Kent, right? The big difference of hosting Camp Kent is that they are doing parent pickup or drop off, um, which is something that's not was not part of my normal operating procedure. Jarrett, myself, we went over how we could best do this effectively and not affect any of the operations, not have cars on the property or anything like that. Would that be something? And and I, I, this is just a hypothetical, and I don't expect there to be an answer for it right now. But would that be something that would be considered a special event? Because it would be a significant change to my operating procedure that I would submit under. I, I think so. My my sense, the way you've described it, David, is that um, you have. I think it's is it seventy acres of property. I have 310 acres. Okay, well, I was way off. I apologize for that. So um, the idea would be that, uh, you know, again, this what you've described as camp, camp is kind of uh, similar to what historically was a youth camp. And so the mm -hmm. issue is for the days in the summer, let's say this is a summer operation, June to August or September, whatever it's going to be, we expect to have up to, let's just say 300 kids or however many at the site. Parents are going to drop off. They're going to park here. And they're going to have activities on the site. We may have sleepovers once a week, but they're going to eat at the mess hall, et cetera. I think you explain that to the commission. The commission says, you know what? You got you got good sight lines at your driveways. You got places to park. There's no traffic hazards. That's a baseline activity. You're good to go. And, and David, my response to you again is a hypothetical in return, right? Because the commission may may have an issue with something. Um, so you said, well, we're going to do three thousand kids. Every week, it's like, whoa, 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 hang on a sec. And they're all sleeping over. Whatever else is going to happen, it's like, hang on a second here. Um, that might be a different scenario. And I think if there is a music event with, with amplified sound, I think that starts to get more and more into the area. Let's take a closer look at that and make sure that we've got good procedures in place so that, that we can manage this. And if you said, I want to do it every night between, you know, summer solstice and uh, Labor Day is like, hang on a second, that's too much. But if you said, I'd like to do one a week or one a month or one a season, the commission might give you pre-approval for that and say, sure, you've got good procedures in place for that. So I think my sense is that it's important for you and for any applicant to present information to the commission about how these events can be managed in an appropriate way and mm -hmm. at that point in time, I think the commission would become comfortable with the nature of activities, which perhaps they haven't even seen before, but it, they're well run, well managed, no problems, everything's good. Great, thank you, Glenn. So my next question, if we go to 6630, number two. Yeah. Um, so it says um, on number two, all youth camps shall uh, maintain you know, the up-to-date register A and B, but then at the bottom it says youth camp and or a camp resort. So here's my challenge on that. I, I do understand all the youth camp regulations from the state and everything, and they do require um, the up-to-date register names, uh, occupants, the whole nine yards. Um, but technically, it's because the youth camps are acting as guardians at that point. Yep. yep. Right? If I if, if I would not give a register, so we do require that the school groups and the camp groups that are on property have that register, you know, have that stuff, um, but we don't hold on to it, right? That burden is on the school or camp and based on their you know, the Department of Education policy or based on their Board of Health, um, you know, the, the state or, or local municipality Board of Health. 
not you know, we don't have a copy of that. It yeah, so, so let me let me just slow you down here, David. I think so. The issue here is I think we've got a, a conflict, as you pointed out. Thank you for this. But it says all youth camps at the beginning, and then down here it says youth camp or camp resort. Camp resort was originally added here because it's quite possible that camp resort in their uh, menu of activities could also be operating at times as a youth camp. But I think now that you've pointed this out, I think this phrase here is redundant and should be eliminated. So yeah. if you're operating as a youth camp, this is a state requirement. You have to comply with it. The records have to be open. And if you are a camp resort, but you're still operating as a youth camp, you fall underneath that definition, then you're going to have to do this. So I, right. I think and at which we're, point we're I not trying to keep track of your say. other guests. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, going just very quick with 66 and 30, um, you know, I see here it's regarding a special permit. Um, that, you know, like for instance, Club Getaway does serve alcohol. We do sell alcohol here. Um, and that would have to go through my 6620 special permit. Um, and it, I'm assuming that that's all 6620, right? The same I think thing it would like be. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I think there was some place in here. Let me just, uh, did you have the, yeah, this right here, this number here highlighted in yellow? Yeah, that, but that would go through the 6620 permit. I just want to, oh, right. okay. And I would expect again, Accept is authorized as part of the special permit. So I think that you would testify to the commission, provide information that this is a normal part of your adult camp or other activities, and you want to be able to continue to do that. And I think at that point in time, the commission would evaluate that. And I can't tell you exactly which way they go, but I, I think I have a sense of that. But the issue here was that, whoa, 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 you can't just do it if you haven't asked for it. And that's why this is in here this way. Okay. Fair Fair enough. Um, so then going into number five, it does say unless approved by the commission with special permit. Um, and that obviously where it affects me would be our motorboats as well as um, the vehicles and not, you know, all terrain, but, you know, golf carts and things like that, where we have to get around to transport, you know, people if necessary, whether emergency or maintenance or whatever it is. Um, but, but, um, would that be falling? Would that be a separate special permit, or would that fall under sixty six twenty as well? I, I think we should make sure. I think that's the sixty six twenty. So good catch. And again, okay. I think we're not trying to uh, limit. Uh, if you decided to open a, a you know a dirt riding camp that unmuffled motorbikes are going twelve hours mm -hmm. a day, it's like hang on a second here. It, I feel, on the other hand, it's your operation of vehicles for the convenience of guests to transport them to parts of the property for activities, et cetera, and they're muffled, and that's not a problem. So I, I wouldn't think so. But I think that we need to clarify here in number five that this is 6620. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so I do know, and I don't know the regulation on this, but there is a town regulation regarding special events and one property per one calendar year. I'm assuming that 6640 would supersede that. Is that is that it would yeah. yeah, I think it I think it, it would, David. I think okay. the idea is the commission has been working on different types of special events on town property by nonprofits, neither of which applies in your scenario. So this in a sense is a provision here, which is intended to allow for you to apply for special events. Mm -hmm. um, under a, a unique set of regulations that applies to private property for a profit-making enterprise, the other ones are public property or nonprofits. So this okay. is this is this is your venue right here. That's a perfect. Thank you. But just um, to clarify, very specifically for um, this for this camp slash resort, youth camp or camp slash resort, in terms of the commercial property. So so this is those those special events. Um, this supersedes the special event um, regulation that we just crafted um, and is that we, we just approved after after um, public hearing. This is for very specifically, as I said, the, the, the camps. Great. And not just that, I think, David, too, it's, it's only for camps that have gotten 6620. Understood. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Um, so going 6638B. I'm sorry if I'm jumping around here. All right. Um, any such improvement shall be completed in accordance with GF, CGS Section A3, which says plan should be co completed within five years. 
So if I submit a master plan, and this is one thing that I'm actually very excited about, um, is submitting this master plan and you know what what what, what I want to do. Does that mean I could only submit a five-year plan? Like, what if I have a ten-year plan? What if I have a twenty-year plan? Is that you know? And that was so my so Dwight, my lawyer, is not here tonight. Um, he did. He looked up that thing, and it says, "With such site plan shall be completed within five years after the approval of the plan." Um, is that a normal thing with the town? I've just never been there before, so I don't know. Yeah. So we've got two different things going on here. I think the the question mm -hmm. is a quote site plan. Versus here, we're talking about a master plan. So there's, ask Dwight that question, the difference between the two. Um, the statute actually, A3I, does provide for a longer period of time, depending on when a project was approved. So for some activities, David, they're up to 14 years. Right. So okay. it Perfect. it's in, the, so the, the only thing we're doing here is if they, I don't ever actually see the legislature put the genie back in the bottle about five years. So whatever the statute says is what you would get. And you can come back to the commission and say, listen, I still have a couple of cottages I want to build in my master plan. I just want to refresh the approval for a fresh five. And I think the commission could, could do that and, and, and send you on your way. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so number 10, and, and this is, um, you know, when I was talking to Dwight about this, so the special permit for special events expires within one year. Is that correct? So it's a one year. Oh, and it's hang on a sec. Number 10. No, no, no. I'm sorry. Number 10. I'm, I'm looking at my questions. So I'm oh, oh, question. No. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> sorry about that. That's all right. Uh, yes. I believe it's in 6640 that it expires on March 31st or that it's. Yeah. Okay. I'm with you. Um. So Dwight could not find any other special permit in our regulation or other regulations for that expired in a length of time. And I guess his question was, you know, we just weren't sure, is that legally permissible? And and has that? Well, I, I mean, David, I can't answer that. I'm not an attorney. I can't answer that. Um, Dwight should know the answer. Um, there was a recent it's, Connecticut it's, Supreme it's Court this recent yeah. Connecticut Supreme Court decision that allows the um, application of time limits to special permits because the circumstances may change. So any application would be reviewed against the criteria and the regulations. And if due to the, you know, the passage of time, what was approvable 10 or 20 years ago wouldn't be appropriate today, then at that point in time, there's uh, an issue, if you will. And so we've taken that scenario here and applied it to say, you could choose, I, I wouldn't suggest this, David, but you could choose to apply for your special events one by one. It's time consuming, it's wasteful, it, it doesn't help the commission. But I think if you were to put together a master plan for the year to say, okay, look, there, these are the different, like a pyramid of events or something we'll call it, right? And so the baseline is somewhere up that pyramid, the commission is just gonna say, these are fine. And then you're gonna get above a threshold, the commission is gonna say, okay, explain to us, if you said, well, I'm gonna have four separate weddings going on for 250 people each, the commission might say, well, whoa, 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 slow down a second here. How, how's that gonna work? So some of those are, you know, certain thresholds would fall below the line, some others would be above. But you can get pre-approval for an entire year and you can do it in October for the, for the subsequent year. But if you haven't done it by March, then the issue is, look, you, you don't have approval to continue. So I think it, it encourages you to master plan with the commission. And David, just to be just to be clear, and and Glenn, stop me if 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 I'm misspeaking at all. But the the 6620 special permit is is a special permit that establishes the baseline, and that's that's not something that that expires year over year. Correct. Um, the 6640 special permit is for something that you want to try or a series of mm -hmm. things that you want to try. You want to try that for, um, you want to try that for the summer, for the season and see whether it works. So you, you give us this idea that you want to do these five or seven things, you're going to do it for this year. And then um, sometime before March, you come back and say, you know, that really worked for me. Um, I'd like right. to do that again. And we say, well, this worked for us, but this didn't. And right. then and then we, we come up with it with another special permit for another year. 
I think there's a provision in here, at least it's the idea that after a certain period of time, when you come back to us year over year over year doing the same thing, and we and it's we're somewhat maybe not rubber stamping it, but words we're continuing to say, yes, that works for you and it works for us, then that can roll into a 6620 permit that they don't have to continue to come back to us for. Or I think the other thing, Matt, is that right here under uh, 1B, it says the commission can approve it for multiple years. In other words, if um, David, we like seeing you, for example, but after a while, it's like, you know, we're, <laughs> we're good. You know, you you can have two or three years on this because we, you've demonstrated the ability to do this, and it, it really isn't having negative implications. On the other hand, if you wanted to do a, a junior Woodstock, I'm just being silly for a moment, hypothetical, then the issue is, hang on a sec, maybe we'll try that one year, and the year after, we'll, we're going to have to try to, you know, make sure that that worked well or put new modifications in place. So I, I think the intent here is to work constructively to find uh, a process and improvements and activities that, that work for everybody. So, per perfect. So to be, I mean, fair with, with Club Getaway, you could probably, with, with most of our normal operations, you could set you, you could set a clock or a book. You I mean, we just do the same thing over and over and over yep. again. Um, which so, so I'm not concerned about that, but you know there are obviously some things that I wanted to try, wanted to not try, or, or, or kind of. Um, but some of those things, how how long in advance would I be able to apply for a special permit for a special event? So say for instance, you know, like right now I might be planning for 2025, 2026, um, you know, or at least talking to a client that, you know, it just, I don't want to waste my time or my client's time before, you know, knowing that I would have to get a special permit. Um, yep. Or I wouldn't want to enter into a contract only to say, you know, that that it's not approved or that these are, it's approved with these conditions. So I, I guess my question is, can it, can it be two years in advance? Can it be one year in advance? Because Contrary to what you were saying, Glenn, I don't think I'm going to come with the 10 special permits in October and say, this is what I want to do, because, I mean, hopefully, knock on wood, you know, everything is going to be under my 6620 because it's our baseline of operation. We, we don't really vary from what we do. I think your operative language here, David, is this, unless otherwise approved by the commission. So in other words, if you came to the commission and said, okay, look, I, I'd really like to do a really special event for 2025, you know, uh, King Charles and, you know, Queen, whatever, Camilla's are coming and we're going to have a special event for them. Okay, let's go. Let's plan for it. That's that give you the material that you need to make that work. So I think that, again, the, the, the spirit here is to uh, work together, find ways of things that work and make your business successful. They benefit Kent, et cetera. Um, and to, to run this a little bit with a tight, tighter leash at the beginning until there's clearly demonstration, look, we, we got these, these are not a problem, you're good to go, and then still give you the ability to propose maybe, you know, one major event a year with, you know, fireworks, whatever, I don't know, Rolling Stones, whatever's going to happen. No fireworks. No fireworks. Okay. Um, well, the Rolling Stones, how about the Rolling Stones? There. Rolling Stones, that I'll fight for, but no fireworks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, so this is that was why this language was in here was to provide some flexibility for conversation with the commission. Perfect. Thank you. Um, here's my last question, I promise, unless anything else comes up. But um just taking that, on the other hand, you know, sometimes opportunities present myself present themselves very quickly, right? So okay. and especially unique things will present themselves quickly, such as you, you know, you know, something will come up a month or two in advance if I have an open weekend, right? Um, and, and, and actually that might be more that might be more than than more in advance and just because if something is open and I'm really trying to sell it or trying to move forward, you know, and it could be a month away and I'm like, oh, what's a good idea? It, it still takes a quite a long period of time to, to, to get a special permit, right? I mean, it's 30 days of posting and then, thir you know, and then, then, then yep. meeting and then it, it, it could take up to three months. Um, I, I don't know how would we shorten that if, if that came to me? Can I come to the commission and say, look, this is what I'm doing and this is what, 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 I, what I propose? So I put the language in here at the end that if there was a minor event that kind of came up quickly, mm -hmm. but wasn't specifically addressed in the plan, 
that staff could evaluate and say, you know what, this is pretty similar to the day camps that you've been running. The days aren't going to conflict. This is not going to double up or multiply the activities or events at the site. So you can just go get that. My suggestion for you, David, would be to have this conversation with the commission as part of 6620. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, it's a relief valve or something. So uh, in, in initially, um, I, I don't know which way the commission might go on this. They might say, yes, you know what? We, we would be prepared to try to turn on a dime uh, once per year or something else like that, or I, I don't know what, but but the okay. issue is, is if, if an event goes awry, then the next year's special event permit is perhaps gonna have a rockier road. So it's right. that's now an understanding between both parties that we wanna manage the externalities and let's try to find a way to make that work. So I, I think I would encourage that conversation as Part of a is that can we make that a verb 66? We're going to 6620 it. Okay. <laughs> like that. It, let me tell you, for the past two days, it's been a verb for myself. But but anyway, guys, that's it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you, David. Any other comments from the public? Um, any any thoughts or um uh, advice for for us regarding the camps based on that conversation um, and what about from uh from the commissioners the only thing i see uh on 6637 campsite within 100 feet of a lake or river no campsite shall be established or maintained within 100 feet of a lake or a river um i think uh, David's camp and Kenmont both now have campsites. Uh, I could be wrong. David could chime in on that. Um, I'm not. I, I thought about that, and I haven't done. It, it could be, and and I, I I thought it was a little further away, but but it could be within the hundred feet range. I'm I'm not sure. With one of my cabins, yeah, Lakeview Twenty. So I I when I read that, I interpreted that interpreted that as a as an actual campsite not as a not as a building or a structure an existing building or structure um, any new building or structure i think would would uh would need to conform with the um with the inland setbacks wetlands. in accordance with the inland wetlands but i think that this might be a camp site you know it's a, it's a, a tent site okay uh, david you have no tent sites near within 100 feet of the lake or river, that's not gonna infringe on anything for you? I, I, I don't believe so. We do have one program, our Camp John Waters, that we do camping. Um, I don't, I, I'd have to measure how far it is from the lake and the river, I mean, from the river, from the lake, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'd have to measure how far the closest tent site that we set up would be from to, to the river, to the lake. So but, is, this some, is this something that we can work on? Maybe at least make that a little more clear. Let me, I made a note. I think the idea here again is that for uh, any improvements either at Club Getaway or Kenmont or somebody else, if they've got a campsite within a hundred feet they, and it's been there for years, it's it's a pre-existing non-conforming situation. They're good, that's, that's fine. So I really think we're dealing with something new here. And uh, so I think, uh, and this is in the current regulation. So, you know, I for it's been there for, you know, quite some time. So uh, I made a note of this and we'll talk about this uh, with the commission about uh, either keep it, remove it, or because I think as Matt had indicated, the wetlands regulations essentially, you know, uh, protect any type of structure from going into that area or not protect, prevent, they regulate any type of structure going into that area. Um, and so uh, this may be redundant from 30, 40, 50 years ago. We'll take a look at it. Okay. Uh, and then the other thing that I see is the 630-50, uh, the one that uh, David brought up, the mini bikes, motorcycles, snowmobiles, all-terrain vehicles, motor boats, general and outside public address systems. Um, those, I totally understand what we're trying to do there, that um, you know we don't have someone come in and start a camp for uh, you know, two-stroke 
dirt bike motocross racing uh, right next to, you know, 30 homes. Um, the, uh, I do know that one of the camps has, uh, not David's, um, they do have like a go-kart track. I mean, is this going to be, uh, is this part of that? Um, you know, this seems to be motorized vehicles. Um, and again, they're coming before the commission with special permit, correct? Yeah, I think as part of 6620, I think normal vehicles uh, used at the camp for, uh, you know, delivering uh, food to cottages or a mess hall or other, yes, of course, it's a normal part of the operation. If on the other hand, let's say it was a go-kart track or something else like that, and that was an activity that they were running, you might say, all right, look, if it's electric, it's okay, because we're never going to hear it. But if it's something else, not so much. But it's got to be declared by the applicant and approved by the commission as part of the 6620. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, thank you. That's good observations. You don't want uh, Unadilla and Kent? Well, I did, I did like the sound of the go-kart track. Uh, it's, uh, that's, that's just me. All right, so any other comments from uh, from the commissioners or from the public? All right, so let's uh, let's go on to accessory dwelling units and um, let's open this up to members of the public. And then um, any 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 comments from the from the members of the commission? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Justin, you're you're ready. Um, yeah, uh, just a, a couple things in here. So, one of the requirements for an attached accessory dwelling unit um, is that there be a door uh, connecting to the house. And it seems like there was a question regarding that. Um, what, what's the rationale behind having a door? Um, between the two units, the, the issue I think is there's two there's two particular issues here. If I can go to the top of the next page for a moment, so first of which, um, as Justin, perhaps you're familiar, and other people I think on the commission are, but perhaps some of the participants here tonight are not. State passed Public Act twenty one twenty nine, which basically provided for accessory dwelling units um, across the state in all municipalities under state defined criteria unless a municipality opted out and Kent decided to opt out. What the state law did was it said, you can't restrict it to an owner occupancy situation and you can't require a door on a common wall. Um, and I think that in my experience, I can't speak for Kent today, but I think as we were working on the regulations which were adopted back in 2016, the issue of the owner of the premises residing on the premises ensures that the unit is in fact accessory as opposed to being a two family created. We do allow two families in, in certain situations in the VR district. Yeah. So um, it, that was that situation. And the operable door on the common wall is to provide a situation where the accessory unit for one homeowner could be part of their home. And then the next homeowner could bring their mother-in-law in and then they sell and the next house integrates it. So it doesn't make it a two family house. It makes it a more flexible living arrangement for whoever purchases it. And it doesn't have to have a firewall in between with no separation. This allows it to be integrated back into the unit. I think that seems like a, a potentially sensible design choice for, for some homeowners, but as a requirement, it seems a, it seems a little onerous and unnecessary. Yeah, so uh, yeah, so it's a shell. Okay, got it. Yep, thank you. Um, th another comment I had was on uh, section eight. This this new one, which is is great. Um, there's a there's a reference to median income there. Now the Connecticut Housing Finance Authority publishes tables uh, based on um, HUD, HUD data um, that sort of defines what the uh, area median income is for Litchfield County and what the associated rents should be for a particular income band. So working um, that in there somewhere might make sense. So there's a very 
easy and accessible um, the point of reference for the, for the town and for the uh, for the applicant. Justin, if you have any VIG down at the Department of Housing or CHFA, I think the entire state would benefit significantly from having a go-to website that on a, any particular day will produce for you the median income, the rent, and the sale price based on prevailing interest rates. There should be a, <laughs> there should be a simple website that does this because the math, the math I've seen around the state by by professionals is all over the map. This is the wild west. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, there's there's not a go to source yet. I don't think so. If you've got something you want to share with me, I, I wish you would. Because so I, think I, 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 I I said Ty, uh, the, the link to the the uh, the Chaffa side. So in that that sort of that is what. Uh, most affordable housing in Connecticut is required to follow are the, is the CHAPA tables that that's that's considered sort of the, the Bible <laughs> that, that we're required to adhere to. Um, so it sort of make, makes sense to use that you know, in this regulation as well. Yeah, so the Department of Housing and CHAPA are, are a, similar, but not quite the same. So we were working off of the um, 830G provisions, which relate to accessory mm -hmm. dwelling units. So uh, Either if you or Ty would send me that link, let me take a look at it. Um, I would love to have a reputable source that we could point people to. So there's no question exactly what the standards are. Um, so uh, I'm all ears. Great. Thank you. Anybody else from the public? Um, so for the commission members, Glenn's got a couple of questions here. Um, wondering whether that, uh, that, that 10 year period should be, um, uh, renewed every 10 years. And it's, and, and in, in essence, making that deed restricted forever. Is that, is, am I understanding that right, Glenn? Is that, we should decide whether we want to do that or not? Yeah, I, I don't know. You know, tonight, this is certainly an issue I wanted for the commission to ponder is that Connecticut General Statutes 830G, which is the math, if you will, that goes into deed restricted affordable units and the affordable housing appeals procedure counts affordable housing units when they meet these criteria. And it does provide for a 10 year restriction, whereas typically for uh, most affordable units, it's a minimum of a 40 year restriction. So I think the commission, as part of this, should consider what period they think is appropriate um, for the scenarios where we allow or require a deed restricted unit. So it's the third, a four, the third unit on a property in the village residential. You might have a single family. Now you're adding on your second um, or a detached affordable unit, or it's the two family where the uh, accessory dwelling unit would be the third. At that point in time, their deed restriction is required the way the regulations are currently crafted. And I think, you know, as Justin pointed out, the question is, well, what's the term on this? What's the rent on this? It makes a, it makes a meaningful difference to the people who might propose one of these. So I think that this is an issue that um, I don't have a recommendation for the commission yet. I think we should think about it and decide what, what we feel is the right approach for Kent. Okay, that's fair. Um, any comments from the members of the commission? Any more comments from the public before I suggest we move on to conservation developments in the VR1 and in the VR1 and 2 and the RU1? Yep. So let's do that. Um, and then um, let's ask if there are any comments regarding the suggested changes in. Let's start with the with the the, the village residential because I think they're I think they're distinct to a certain extent, um, and certainly I've got more comments myself to the to the, the to these proposed changes in the VR than I do in the in the rural zone. So let's start there. Does, are there any comments limited to the suggestions in the VR one? And I see, I see Yos is ready. Uh, 
Uh, hi, this is Jos Dobbos. Um, yeah, I have some comments on this and also on the other uh, conservation development zone. Um, so one thing is um, the village um, residential uh, conservation uh, development is referred to um, under um, special permits, it requires a special permit and it uh, refers to the um, 6700 um, section. Um, with the uh, conservation development in the rural district, there is no such referral to the um, uh, 5200 chapter about the overlay district. Um, I think we need a referral that too. I know it doesn't require special permit because it would be the standard, but it should still be mentioned in um, the regular in the uh, uh, in the district uh, descri description that uh, conservation development is the standard option for development, shouldn't it? So, Josie, you, you're kind of mixing the village versus the RU1. So if I can jump ahead here for a sec. It's sort of what I was trying to avoid, but um, if you think you can manage that, Glenn, going back and forth, I'd... Yeah, I mean, there are there, there similarities and differences. So, so you know, uh, section 5200 of the regulations requires the conservation development overlay district overlays the RU1. The entire RU1 is basically how this is defined, okay? And basically what the overlay district requires is that any residential subdivision in the RU1 has to be a conservation development approach. So it's not a special permit. You don't ask for it. You are required to do it. Right, That's but the it should between... still be mentioned in the district itself, right? Um, maybe. Let me think about that. And in that regard, also, it should be mentioned in the um, subdivision regulations. I, I saw your draft for the new subdivision regulations, and um, there's no Yours? mention... Yes, just hold. Um, we, I don't think we're ready to talk about the subdivision regulations, and and that's I I I, I, I know that you want to tie all this together, but I I really prefer to talk about the conservation development in the village center resident, the village residential districts, so that um, we can keep this somewhat on track. Right, but you're talking about subdivisions here. So why is it only mentioned in the zoning regulations? and not in the subdivision regulations. Um, and uh, OK, so I'll answer that question, but then I'll ask you, please, let's let's try to keep this to the village residential, because we're, we are getting ready to revise our subdivision regulations, and none of us have had a chance, um, or a chance is the wrong word, but none of us have really studied this, um, the subdivision regulations, because we've been concentrating on these other things first. So that's what what you're saying very well may come out in the subdivision regulations, and and we'd we'd love for you to be involved in those discussions when the time is right. And the, the only other thing I, I might like to add, if I could, Matt, is that Yos, as part of our original work on the zoning regulations five years ago, you had submitted some written comments which were very thoughtful. And if if you have the opportunity to put those down on paper, I, I think we can now take a look at the interaction between the different regulations, et cetera, and, and do it in a holistic way rather than sort of a line by line way. Um, and that'd be very cool. beneficial and helpful for us. Yeah. Okay. Um, then um, the number one under the village residential, then uh, the number one. Um, 1A uh, should be here, but as you mentioned, uh, could move everything below um, to over to section 6700 because all the rest there, the uh, further description, shouldn't that just be in the overlay zone chapter? 
6700 chapter instead of here? It, so you know, so what we were working with was the regulation change, which was submitted by a, an applicant and reviewed and approved by the commission, split the provisions up between 3124 and 52, uh, 6700, I think, or uh, excuse me, yeah, I think it was 6700. Right. That's right. And so it's maybe not the most efficient way to have done it. So I tried to work within that framework to craft this regulation. But as you can see here in the sidebar, I, I asked the commission, should should we just move everything over to 6,700? And so if that's your, if, if yeah, that's your I, thought. I agree with that. Yeah. Okay, well that that's, okay. yeah. So I, I you know, so it's gonna be easier for us if you make a statement rather than ask a question. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, then, um, so you now, um, uh, the open space, and I was separate from the um, unbuildable area. So in the um, uh, development that came up in North Main Street, that was not done. Um, so this is a major change, um, which I'm not against, uh, although in the village district, I don't find that as important as in the uh, rural district. Um, but uh, so I, I, I'm not sure um, why he did this when it was not uh, originally done when the subdivision came up. Um, and then uh, let's see, when you're talking about calculation of the number of lots, um, you can also uh, just say that uh, you can cut the um, the minimum acreage or the minimum square footage in half if you set aside at least 50% of the parcel as open space um, and um, of that um, open space at least half shall be uh, buildable or and um, not more than half should be unbuildable. I mean, that's another option, which I think would be a reasonable option in the village district. I don't know how you think about that. I think I think you are gonna get into the weeds, Ghosts, but I very much appreciated your thoughts or comments on the regs six or seven years ago. So I would I would I would urge you to just put your thoughts in writing and then, and let me sort of see them all. I think it'll it'll make it easier for the commission to visualize and understand. Um, so I, I feel like I'm making some work for you and I apologize for that, but I, I think it would it help us very much in this effort and possibly when we get to the subdivision regs as well. Yeah, and, and the 6,700, uh, that's still for the village districts, but the, uh, overlay district here. Um, so under the overall design of development number one, um, A, B, C, and D, those are unbuildable. Um, so they are excluded already. Um, yeah, so you know, so what we're talking about here is the design of the development. And so what we're saying here in one is priority for preservation shall be given to preserving these areas. So originally in the RU1 district, we had identified primary and secondary and, and sort of suggested that primaries should receive priority for preservation, but almost left the impression that the secondary is not so much. And I think the comment we got as part of the POCD is all of these resources are important. They should all be considered and given priority for open space preservation. So that's what we did here. So this is again, just the design of the development where the roads go, where the houses go, how these are laid out and configured. Um, and particularly with the focus on open space greenway and, and connections between uh, conservation areas and things like that. So we were, we were trying to get to a, a holistic approach. Right, but 
at the same time, you're saying that um, the open space should be in um, the build in the buildable area. Um, but then here you're saying you're giving preference for open space to the unbuildable area. So that that's not consistent, right? No, I think one one use is the amount of open space. The commission felt that the uh, calculations uh, could be improved. The wetlands, water courses, steep slopes, and floodplains are likely to be preserved as open space anyway. And so the issue in the village residential district was that the math for the calculation of the number of lots, the base requirement is 10,000 square foot lots in the VR1 and 30,000 square foot lots in the VR2. And after the mathematical calculation in, back in uh, 3100, we got to a point where the remaining land area was divided by 5,000 square feet and 15,000 square feet. And the commission felt that the, the math wasn't really what they felt was the most appropriate and what was meant to be a conservation development. So that's what was modified. Um, yeah, okay. Um, and and you said you removed some resources from likely to exist in the village area, but you, you removed the farmland soils. So the the KC parcel on the west side of North Main Street um, and off of Lane Street. That yeah, is I, prime farmland. So the rest of farmland. Sorry. I, I think the analysis that we had done was that those were in floodplain areas. So well, part of it is floodplain, and, and much of it is on uh, dry land. Okay. Thank you. And um, then the open space. Um, so if it would go to a land trust, it would be like permanently protected if it goes to a homeowners association. What can the open space be used for? I mean, would they, can they put recreation facilities on their playground? Um, can they even put maybe a community septic system there or a sports field or whatever? Um, so it's, quite different if it goes to uh, um, a land trust or to a homeowners association. Yos, which section are you referring to um, now? Um, that would still be in 6700. Oh, and that's, the, so that, that's just a, a, a question that you're asking. Um, yeah, I mean, consideration not to change the, the tax. space that you, it's, um, I wonder if there should be further discussion about um, what can be done in the open space. Um, and if the open space would be just for the um, homeowners of the development or um, possibly public access, uh, there's not, not really a mention of it. Yos back in 3100 here says the open space shall be deeded to the town, a land trust, or other conservation organization or a homeowners association if acceptable to the commission. Okay, right. It's that. Um, but so, uh, how, how do you see the open space used in those cases? I mean, I think every parcel of land is different in terms of its location, its resources, its attributes. So I think this is for the commission to evaluate. I think we, it's important to recognize that in the RU1 district, we require the conservation approach. But in the VR district, somebody's applying for this. And if right. the commission doesn't feel that the approach produces a net benefit for the community, they could deny the special permit, in which case you're looking at 10,000 and 30,000 square foot lots, depending if it's VR1 or VR2. So it's got to make sense overall. Otherwise, 
I don't know that the commission would approve it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, one more thing. Um, shouldn't there be a, a when you have the um, development standards, shouldn't there be a, a broader setback on the outside of the parcel that's being developed, like in this case, 50 foot setback along the outer boundaries, because now it basically only requires a 20 foot setback from the properties next to it. And because this is like a cluster development, shouldn't you have a, a, a buffer area in between? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a possibility. That's a good observation. So that's it's done in other towns. So, um, yeah, I think um, you might want to consider that. I, I think if it would negatively affect the open space that's going to be preserved, I'd like for the commission to have some flexibility in that. Um, but otherwise, I think uh, starting off with the presumption of, as you called it, a broader setback. Uh, could be useful. So thank you for that. Okay, that, thank you. That's it for this. Uh, yes, I, I really would like to, I find your thoughts very insightful. So if you have the opportunity to put them down on paper and send them in, I'd love to see them. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I think you muted, Matt. Sorry, I should just get out of the habit of muting myself and listen to the background noise. Um, so any any uh, other comments from members of the public um, before I jump in and ask uh, the commission members to 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 weigh in? So this is um, this is the least um, the least well developed from the commission, right? So we've spent less time on this discussing then we have discussing the the other items on the agenda tonight and um, but we wanted to make sure that we got public comment um, so that we could move forward um, so I suspect that there's going to be comment and I see Alice has come off mute and she's um, I'll Alice I'll give you the floor if you are ready. you saying I should I can talk if you, you know, <laughs> only if you want Alice Oh, well, I'll, after having listened to that discussion, I'll try to just be very straightforward. Um, I'm interested in understanding section 3124, item 1B, and the similar thing in under the RU. Unless a lower set aside is authorized by the commission, a minimum of 40%, blah, 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 you know, of the billable property, which I strongly urge that we uh, adhere to uh, in spite of some of the gray areas. What I'm trying to understand is that phrase unless a lower set aside is authorized by the commission, what would be the motivation or the reason the commission would authorize that? I'm not sure that you would or whether you should I think. Well, then why may... do you even, why do you even say it? Uh, well, let's back up probably two or three. Okay. <laughs> Gaps, Alice. I think when this was originally okay. crafted, the language read something like, uh, unless modified by the commission. Right. And right. the commission asked me whether or not they could increase the number. And my advice to the commission was regulations are regulations. You can set a, a minimum or a maximum standard. But in the middle of an application process, if you decide you don't like the application, then your 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 uh, options are to deny it, not to increase the open space set aside, because I think that starts to get dangerously close to the concept of a taking of property in the in the middle of a, of a situation. So my recommendation for your consideration is to establish the requirement here, the minimum set aside of open space. If somebody comes along and says, you know what, I'm going to give you the most beautiful ravine in Kent, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, I'm going to really, you know, make this like a mini park or something else and go above and beyond, 
And the commission says, wow, that, that is uh, a, a great amenity for us, or it's a, the most significant environmental habitat in town or something else like that. And somebody says, and I, I'd like to give you 33% or 35% instead of 40. And the commission could say, you know what? That, that makes sense for us to do that. If somebody says, I just want to give you less, the commission, I think, should, should look at that and say, no, our minimum's 40. So well, that 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 I, that's why I tell you, I still don't want know why you just don't say a minimum of forty percent. And by the way, the same subject under uh, the RU says that the way we didn't want it unless modified by the commission. Why did why is that wording still oh, in there for for the RU? You changed it for the VR, and I still um, don't quite understand why it isn't just a fact that a minimum of 40% under VR and a minimum of 50% under the, I, I, I don't see why you're putting that wiggle room back in there. It Alex, just ask. I, I didn't mean to, I just want to hold ourselves to the same standards and, and, and try to talk about the VR one, and then we can bring up the same thing when we get to the RU one. I just, I don't Well, I, I only reason I, I fast forwarded to it is he just said it, and I just, he just said, unless modified. Uh, okay. And I, I, I thought I want, the whole idea was to, tell, to get rid of it. I don't want to tell Joe that that he can't talk about it and then let you talk about it. Not no, let, no, I'm not talking. I'm I'm not, I'm, I'm not talking about what Yo said. I'm talking about what Lynn just said. Okay, I, I'll stick with the VR. Why and B do we say unless a lower set aside? Why don't we just say a minimum? Got it. Made a note, Alex. Okay, and the next and it, those then when you get to the RU. You know what I'm gonna say. Okay, it's <laughs> great. Um, any other any other um, commission members who have any comments? Uh, just that I completely agree with Alice Hicks on that. Um, okay, so um, I will say that I completely disagree um, with that. Um, I believe that the commission should have the opportunity to um, to to approve a lesser amount if it makes sense for the particular parcel. Um, that's that's so. I'll say that, and um, I will also say that I am um, very strongly against limiting um, um, the, having in here that. The, the language about the area of the parcel, which is not designated as wetlands, watercourse, or steep slopes, or 100-year floodplains. I think that we, as a, as a community, have just gone through um, our housing plan, and many, many, many people on this call were part of that housing plan discussion, and it was determined that we really terribly need housing in town, um, and to, to, to limit the ability to count um, the 100 year floodplain in particular as, um, as part of that 40% set aside really will limit the amount of buildable land on any, on any parcel, the limited number of parcels that we've got in the village of Kent. So I think that, I think that language that's, that's highlighted um, should really come out. Um, the area, I think it should be 40% of the area of the parcel. Now, I'm not suggesting that's for, for any, any place else except for the BR1 and the BR2. I agree with, with Matt on that. In the VR zones, you know, they, you have to remember the VR zones, they, these are small, they're small areas. There's not a lot of build, buildable space. It's completely different when you're looking at the rural zones. But when you start taking everything out and you take the option of the, when you start taking, you know, watercourse, steep slopes, hundred year floodplains out of that, out of that fi figure and you look at the map and look what, where we're talking about. There's not a lot left. 
you know, what, and we, we do, we say it in the POCD, we need more housing. We want that housing right in town. You know, so um, anyway, I agree. I agree with Matt. And I also agree that we should, at least in the VR1 and VR2, have the ability, should the right situation arise to lower the, uh, the open space. You know, remember this is a, the conservation development is a, is an incentive. We're providing an incentive to a developer to do something. That's what this is. Otherwise they don't have to do it. They can just do a regular subdivision. We're trying to provide an incentive for a developer to build some houses closer. We're allowing some tighter density in exchange for some open space. You know, this the conservation development is, is a win for the town. It is not a win for the developer necessarily at all. It's an incentive. And I think everybody has to remember that. And you have to look at the VR1 and the VR2 zones differently than the rural zone. So it's in a, it, it's certainly so there's there's certainly this difference of opinion among the um, among the commissioners, and I think that's going to require some additional discussion and thought. Um, I don't think I don't think we're going to resolve that tonight. But I th but I think tonight is 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 an informational meeting. It's it's a, it's a place for people to air their thoughts regarding what's been written so far. Um, so I think I would, uh, to my, my, my last comment um, is I wonder why we're swapping C2 and 3, CI and, I'm sorry, CII and CIII, where we divide the, you know, however we however we establish number one, number I, letter I, the applicant shall take the total area, um, et cetera, um, reduced by 40 percent, um, and then that total square feet by the minimum lot size, and then um, the result of that will be the maximum number of lots. And and now we're suggesting that we um, that we take the the land area as modified as 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 we may decide um and then reduce the land area by 40 percent and then divide that by five or ten depending on what zone we're in five or 15 depending on what zone we're in so what's the what's the purpose of swapping those is the, is the calculation easier yeah so i think uh if i can jump in matt i think the idea was as you pointed out that Commission talked about this at our last meeting, and we didn't fully vet this before we came to the public informational meeting. My understanding from the commission's conversation was step one was that wetlands, watercourses, vernal pools, steep slopes, and floodplains should not be counting towards density at all. So those were deducted. So this section C here is the maximum number of lots. Right. Section B up above is the amount of the parcel which is going to be open space. Right. There's two separate mathematical calculations here. And if we're going to calculate the number of lots, you take out the wetlands, water courses, steep slopes, or floodplains first. You take the remaining land area and take 40% of that as being the open space set aside provision, divide that by five and 15, and that tells you the number of lots. And I, I I understand how that I understand the the calculation and the logic for that math. It's just that in the current regulation we do the dividing by um, the minimum lot size before we take out the forty percent. So we come up with the number of lots and then reduce that by forty percent, as opposed to coming up with the with the land area. Um, I'll go back and take a look at that, Matt. I, I maybe I read it differently, or whatever. I'll, I'll go back and take a look at that. Yeah, and, but, and, but and Matt, that would be, be incorrect. Fine. No, hold on, Josh. No. Josh, sorry, but it, it may be fine either way. You know, it might be like adding and subtracting. Um, that's the order of operation. Um, I just wonder. You know, it's worth it's worth thinking about. 
No, I think I might want to do a, a comparison for the commission about how the math works under what order of operations and what the end result is. So I think it's worthwhile having a conversation. Okay. I think but it makes sense Man that oh, okay. Yosef, um, Connie Manis, I'm sorry, um, Connie Manis, Ty ended up having to bow out. So um, I'm just letting you know that Connie Manis has her hand raised. And I think she might be able to answer the question because I think when we did the conservation development the first time, we did have it the opposite way, but then it was a recommendation by the Conservation Commission to bump it the other way. And I think Connie can confirm that I could be wrong. Okay, then let's, um, Connie, if it's okay, and, and Yost too, I'd like to, uh, to, I'd like to put a pin in that. And then, um, and then uh, I just wanna make sure that there's no other comments from the, from the commission members, since we're sort of in that, in that mode. Then, um, Yos, you have well, some? Yeah, I just wanted to say it, it makes much more sense this way because the these are the unbuildable areas that are being taken out. You can't build in there, so they, they should not count towards uh, how many parcels you can get in there. That's why that is mentioned first. Uh, if, yes, but the question is why why step number two and three have changed, not not step one and something else. Um, okay, I'm sorry, Connie. Thanks for waiting. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not going to solve your issue there. Uh, it's it's uh, my comment was not about the math. Uh, I really just and I didn't have a comment until I started listening to the commissioner's um, comments and I, I, I understand that you're going to discuss this further but I just did want to express my support for Alice's comment. Uh, I think that um, inviting uh, applications that suggest that there should be less than 40% uh, really is an invitation for every applicant to request less than 40%. And um, I think, we, you know, we've learned from North Maine that uh, the conservation development is not necessarily uh, creating the kind of housing that we know we desperately need in Kent and that that's going to require different kinds of incentives, which we're working on as well. Uh, I just think uh, giving the opening to every applicant to request less is going to mean that you're going to do it each and every time, and that you uh, you should make it an absolute, make it easy for yourselves. You're not really going to have the situation of the ravine. We know that. Uh, so at least with the village residential, just you know, put a point on that and and let it be a minimum that you don't modify. That's my comment. I know you'll talk about it further. Thanks, Connie. So any other uh, any other comments? Alice and Karen, do you want to uh, rebut? Uh, I want to rebut yours. I, <laughs> I, I just see that if, if you don't have a set minimum of what is buildable, then it undermines the whole idea. Connie alluded to it from one methodology. I just, so what's, then what's the, why even have conservation development? If every applicant can say, I only, I only wanna you know, leave 10% open because I need this, this, and this, and otherwise I'm not gonna do it. Then, okay, then don't do it. Or okay. then, or go back to as, you know, don't even do a conservation development. I, I don't know. I okay. I don't want to rebut anything. I'm just very concerned that there not be a set minimum. And, and, and basically, I, I believe that for the uh, rural too, but that's a whole, we don't we didn't get there. I believe that uh, a lower set aside is authorized by the commission should go also. Um, I think that it should be just a set. 40%, that's it, straight up, makes things easy. Um, then we don't have, I, I highly doubt that that we would even 
uh, accept anything from anyone if they came and said, we, are, we only want to put 10% aside, uh, but we'll give you this. I, I don't think that that would ever pass through anyway, but um, I think it should be just a straight 40%. You know what it is. We know what it is. Um, and I also uh, think that if in the VR1 and the VR2, um, that the hundred year flood plain, the water courses, the steep slopes sh can, should be used as that 40%. Um, there's no reason why you couldn't use that as an open space. I mean, if someone were to develop the, um, the Casey property uh, and utilize that portion that's in the floodplain as their 40%, um, and then gave that property to the town of Kent, um, you know, that could be a great asset to the, to the town. So uh, those are my thoughts. Okay. Um, yeah, I think there's, there's, there's definitely more work to be done here. Um, certainly another, uh, another conversation. Is any, any, other, any other comments that we should consider as we move forward in our, in our deliberations, either from the, from the public or the, or the members of the commission before we um, move on maybe to the, to the conservation development in the rural district? Then let's do that. Then let's, let's uh, move on to the conservation development in the rural district and, and, and some of the, the discussions that we've been having today. Um, so, uh, Yos, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll put you up in the poll position if you're ready. Okay. Yes. Um, so, um, um, the informal discussion uh, that's mentioned under um, 523, um, so, I should have mentioned that in the other one, um, that was, uh, Glenn had suggested adding that to the village district too, and I, I agree with that. I think that's important. Uh, and I think you can add site visit too as, a, as an option, because um, that's important for the commission also. And also that you can invite other officials like the Conservation Commission to uh, participate in the pre-application review and in the site visit. Uh, that's done in a lot of towns. And uh, I, I think that really helps the process. Then you don't have to go through too many steps and constantly change the plans to come with a, um, a pre-application um, plan, a sketch plan and everybody involved can talk about it you can come up with a concept plan um, that is much more likely to be acceptable to everybody. Um, so I wanted to mention that first. Um, then as, as I mentioned before, it's, this is not referred to in um, section 3200, the rural or residential district. I think it should be referred to this conservation development overlay zone. And the uh, subdivision regulation should also refer to this, or this could even go in the subdivision regulation, because actually you're talking about subdivisions. So why is it um, um, treated uh, mainly in, or only in the zoning regulations? Um, but I mentioned that before, so um, then under 5240, um, I'm glad you took out the um, primary and secondary conservation areas because the primary conservation areas were all built unbuildable lands, and that was um, a developer would, of course, choose those first for their up open space set aside, and all the other things that we value would not be looked at. Um, so the, the um, planning commission, um, with the uh, 
advice from the Conservation Commission should really have more leeway to say what is important in this particular parcel. And that if everything that is mentioned here is mapped and it's good that you added core forest areas, et cetera, um, then you can make uh, a better um, choice of um, open space set aside. Then let's see. Um, so originally you had 50% under, um, what is it, 5242, you had 50% of the conservation development area. Now it's 50% of the buildable area shall be preserved as open space. Um, so that's uh, an increase in most cases except when you're talking about very easily buildable land like on um, farmland and so. Um, the, um, by the way, the things that I mentioned under one, um, I think it's, there should be a note why these have to be mapped, like saying that the applicants to minimize disruption and negative effects on these resources through careful site design and through the selection of open space to be protected. I think something like that will make it clearer and will give the commission um, a basis to, to guide where, which open space will be so selected. And where it says under, um, under number three, the um, areas of the site which are considered for preservation open space shall be deeded to the town, land trust, or other conservation organization or homeowners association. Um, shouldn't you also give the option of, um, a, um, of development rights uh, uh, easement uh, because a, like a land trust may not be too interested in um, getting deeded land um, and maybe an easement would be easier for them to take. Especially if it's uh, divided over several pieces uh, it's it's good that you want uh, it to be contiguous. Uh, totally support that. Um, then here also uh, the question: Should the open space be uh, like reasonably accessible to all residents of the development? Or should it be made accessible to the general public or, or would that vary based on the project? Like if it's next to existing trails, um, is this up to the commission to decide basically? Okay. And under 5250 development standards, that's on the next page, I think. Um, it's, this was actually also mentioned in the other one for the village district. Uh, so subdivision of lots, common interests, ownership community, or a planned unit development. There's no definition of planned unit development. So it, it should be in the definitions, right? And as I understand it, the planned unit development has a um, homeowner um, association and common amenities, but uh, the homeowners under 
own lots. Um, and similar to the Phyllis district, I think you need to have a, um, a buffer along the outside lines of the parcel, in this case, probably a hundred foot buffer from, from the neighbors. Jos, would you um, would you suggest that that buffer is included as part of the open space set aside, or in addition to? Uh, no, just a setback setback requirement. Because now we just have a minimum side yard, a rear yard setback of twenty feet. So uh, the houses of the um, development can be twenty feet from the neighboring property. And, and the neighbors, that that's they, different. I'm sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. The neighbors may have larger lots and be used to larger lots around, and and they probably won't like it if they suddenly get a um, a more clustered development right next to them. Therefore, I think you need to have a bit of a buffer zone there. But again, not as part of the open space. Just no, as, not as part of the open space. Just as a setback. Right. So, 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 in essence, more of a more open space provided for these conservation subdivisions. Well, it's not open space. It would be probably it, it could be part of the lots. It's just the the buildings, the structures would have to be at least a hundred feet from the outer partial line. A hundred feet, you're suggesting. That's 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 what you're. That's your suggestion. Yeah, and that, that's used in some other towns too. Uh, that's pretty standard. So that's standard. Okay, great, thanks. And, and as far as the 50% um, of open space, that is also standard if you um, Google open space developments, uh, it's typically minimum of 50%. Otherwise, you basically shouldn't call it an open space development. And uh, just to be no. clear, um, the uh, the the fifty percent that you've you've mentioned several times is not included as part of the regulations as they exist now, nor the um, nor the suggested changes. That's that's something I just want to make that clear because um, it's fifty percent is uh, is 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 not hasn't been discussed so far. So that that's that's your understanding too, right, Jos? Right. Well, and and it has been fifty percent in this district. So I mean that stays the same. Um, but in, in general, um, to be called the conservation development, um, it's standard to have minimum 50% open space. Otherwise, you shouldn't call it a conservation development. Got it. Thanks for that, Jos. Um, well, I think that's it. And thank you. Um, anybody else? I think Connie's got her hand up again. Okay, thanks, Glenn. Ms. Manis? Uh, just a note on that side yard setback. Um, I wanted to clarify uh, for you and anyone else, um, Matt, who, who is not familiar with how conservation easements work, I would strongly recommend in addition to the setback as opposed to making a buffer around the entire development, a conservation easement or a conservation property. That has been one of the most expensive and most difficult types of conservation properties to monitor. It's not something that most land trusts would be interested in monitoring or owning. And I think that the description of it as a buffer is a clear indication of how this is distinctive from open space that provides a public benefit uh, as opposed to a, a buffer for neighbors. So I agree with Yost that there is an issue with um, a conservation subdivision that would then suddenly uh, you know, uh, at least cut in half 
the side yard setback uh, as opposed to a neighboring property that is not a conservation subdivision, but I don't think that it should be made part of that open space set aside. Thanks. Um, any other public comment before I just ask uh, Alice to somewhat reiterate what she had what she had said before regarding the uh, um, regarding the uh, unless modified by the commission language? Well, I that was my question. I, I I'm sure. I mean. <laughs> What else can I say? I think that it should be a set minimum. And I've several other people have given even other reasons, but I don't think, I mean, I, I can't say it any other way. I think there should be a set minimum. And to say unless modified opens up what that's opens modified because of what? And you've just heard five or six reasons why. <laughs> so. I'm not sure what else I can say. I think it should be, it undermines the idea of conservation. If, yeah, you can't meet, if you can't meet the minimum, then develop it under some other thing. I don't know. I just wanted to give you the opportunity to say it again because I, I, um, I cut you off a little bit earlier. So it's- That's okay, you can cut me off. I still, still think it's pretty simple. <laughs> So we did we did have that wording changed to number two, unless modified by the commission to what um, Glenn had done earlier. Right. Yeah, I think um, that, so, was a, that was a mistake on my part. I, I meant to meet the language consistent and somewhere in the editing that that got dropped. So uh, good yeah, catch, no, Alice. No, no problem. Um, uh, I feel that, and again, I, I feel pretty strongly still about the uh, you know, if we're going to give a percentage that it needs to be that percentage. Um, if we give any wording in there, you know, unless modified by the commission, unless the commission says it's okay to do, if, if we leave that wording there, it just opens up uh, people who come in and read the regulations uh, can say, oh, well, here, here's some wording that's going to work to our benefit. So that's my thought. Great. Um, Karen or Adam, anything to add? Uh, I, I pretty much agree with the last couple of speakers. Um, and uh, I think by not having a certain actual amount percentage, you're diluting the whole purpose of conservation development. Um, that's just my feeling. I think uh, uh, Alice and Chris said it pretty well, a and Connie. Thanks, Karen. Um, Glenn, do you think you have enough of a flavor for the discussion to um, move forward with some revisions and then we can um, talk about this again the next time we meet? Yeah, I think um, my approach, Matt, I think would be to, to organize the comments that we've heard here tonight to kind of summarize them for the commission to uh, not verbatim, but just to kind of summarize the general uh, area of comments. Um, I think I may have to watch this again to be able to capture all of the comments on the conservation. And I think that's the one that got the most comments. Um, I realize there's some differences of opinion, but I may have a chance to put some thought into it so that, you know, we can offer some choices for the commission about how to move forward. Um, understand the thought about having a percentage that's fixed. Also somewhat sensitive to Matt's remarks that one of the reasons that the open space percentage might be adjusted by the commission could be for the provision of affordable housing. So there's, there's ways to meet multiple objectives here as part of the whole conversation about conservation. So let me get my thoughts together. Our next meeting is scheduled for, I think it's May. Um, and then I think at that point in time, if the commission feels ready, we could move forward with public hearing or we can continue to work on the conservation development side. I think the other ones are, not too too many things to tweak, but but conservation clearly needs more work, and I'll 
I'll take that on. Thank you. Great, and it would be, uh, you know, it would be, it would be really beneficial for um, for the members of the public who have um, um, a stake or or opinions about this to to join us at our our our, our May meeting um, as we as we get closer to um, going to public hearing, and then which you know, it's, it's certainly it's a, it's a, it's a it's a public hearing that we'll go to next, which which will not next, but after that, um, so there'll be another bite at the apple for everybody and. Um, uh, before we before we move to adopt, um, so I think we're at a good point to to wrap up. I I think this has been a great conversation, and um, even though we're not in agreement, I think that makes us uh, it makes us stronger as a commission and as a community that we so we can we can work through some of the the differences of opinion and and come to the regulation that's going to work for for most. Um, so. If there's, let me just make sure I'm back to the agenda. Um, Ty, is there anything that we need to add before we um, maybe uh, move to adjourn? No, you're good. Your next meeting is May 18th for a special meeting for this kind of discussion. Okay, great. And then any other final thoughts from anybody in the audience, from commissioners or the public? Great. Well, thanks again, everybody. I would look for a motion to uh, to adjourn. I'll make that motion. I'll make that motion. I heard you. All right, Joe. Oh, okay. Thanks, Adam. Give me a second, somebody. Somebody I'll, second. I'll second it. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Karen. I, I would if I could. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Glenn. And um, I'll call the I'll call the vote. All those in favor, so signify. And everybody's got their hand raised. And thanks all. And we'll see you soon. Thank good night, you. everybody. Have a good night.